This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. On July 27, 2012, Catherine and David Lowry began an epic journey to run the length of South America, over 5,000 miles through some of the most awe-inspiring and biologically rich ecosystems on Earth. Catherine will be the first woman to run the continent, and as a team, they will be the first to run the continent unsupported. They hope that through sweat, tears, and determination, they can open a portal into the last wilds of South America and rekindle people's passion for running and for our amazing natural world. Learn more about their adventure at 5000mileproject.org. Catherine and David Lowry, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thank you Hi, so Paul. much for having us. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here. So, guys, how did the idea for this expedition come about? Well, we were um, busy working on some seabird work in the Caribbean, and everything was coming together for us, we were starting to see that the, you know there's some major threats to the world at the moment, and the way we're we're living our lives collectively seems to be heading us into a bit of a bottleneck. So we thought, well, this is our time, this is our life stage. We've got our fitness. We don't have dependence, thankfully, for the minute, um, and um, perhaps we can do something, you know, using the limited faculty we have to try and inspire some environmental action. And the, the natural thing for us is, is we're runners. We, we love to be outside. We love to be in the hills running. And, and we started to think, well, what about it? What about if we try to run the entire length of South America and we try to do it in a year? Would, would that work? Would it be possible? And, and we just started dreaming about it. And, um, and then about two years later, here we are in Caracas. <laughs> hey, wow, we're heading towards Caracas. What is the main goal? What's the purpose for doing this run? Well, um, we've got three goals, really. Um, the first is to inspire people to get out there, to do stuff for the environment, and to get excited about our natural world. We think it's amazing, and loads of people do too, and it needs saving, it needs conserving. So that's number one. And then the second is to connect people around the world to the natural places of South America. And we chose South America because it is so incredibly biodiverse. Um, biodiversity rich. It's got the Amazon, the lungs of the world. It's got um, the temperate rainforest of Chile. It's got the, the, some of the biggest rivers in the world, the highest and um, longest mountain ranges. It's an extraordinary continent. So we want people to sort of really find out more about it through our expedition. And the other is to raise money for three conservation charities. That's BirdLife International, Asociación Armenia, who are based in Bolivia, and Conservación Patagonia, who are down in Chile, and they're all doing really amazing stuff on the ground for conservation work out here in South America. Tell me a little more about those organizations and what they're doing. So BirdLife is like the umbrella organization, and we've worked with BirdLife in the past as um, conservation biologists, and so we already know lots of people who are there, we know their work, and so we trust them. We know they're doing some really good work out here with their partners in South America. So they were like, uh, there was obvious for us to, to, to raise some money for. Um, and then their partner is Armenia in Bolivia. And um, we chose, Bolivia is a really special country for us. Um, it's got such extraordinary biodiversity from the Andes all the way down to the Amazon. And, um, and actually running through there was just extraordinary, amazing people. So um, we chose to work to raise money for Asociación Armenia, and particularly because um, we run very close to one of the reserves, which they're at the moment trying to buy. And it's for a really very, very rare macaw. Uh, it's critically endangered. It's the blue-throated macaw. And through that iconic species, which is really on, on, the, on the brink of extinction, that reserve will also help other mammal, other species of mammals, such as the amazing giant anteater, maned wolf, and all kinds of extraordinary wildlife. So through that one iconic species, loads of other species and amazing habitats will be conserved. And then there's the other, and the other charity, and that's Conservación Patagonica, and they're right down in the south, and they're in the most absolutely awesome part of Chile. It's, um, if you can imagine this landscape, really open, 
um, with huge mountain ra- sort of this huge mountain range behind um, snow capped sweeping views vistas with guanacos grazing wild so that you can almost um, walk up to them. It was absolutely extraordinary. We ran past the reserve that Contavesta and Patagonica at the moment are restoring from overgrazed pasture into a fully functioning national reserve is that national park is the plan and then they're going to give that back to Chile to the government um, as a working national park so we're helping them to to do that well that's fantastic (laughs) yeah well I hope so (laughs) yeah a lot that's really um really amazing and we were really lucky because the way our, our RAN worked we were able to see both the reserves so um the reserve in, in Chile and the reserve up in Bolivia as well as we as we ran past. And and we so we've met the people as well, which is also really important for us because we wanted to share the story of the people who are working there and, and get to know some of the wildlife and, and mm. sort of the... the oh, it's, it was fantastic. And the other thing is um, it's an opportunity to ground truth them, you know. So you, you're asking your friends and your family to, to jump on board and part with their hard-earned money and you want to be really sure it goes to the right places. So we've got that confidence now that we've seen the, the areas in rehabilitation and, and we know every penny goes to that. So it's really, it's kind of a relief to us to have seen them as well. Yeah. Oh, Catherine, I think you were speaking a minute ago to the uh, the concept of rewilding. Is that correct? Yeah, that is really, really important because um, when we were running down in the south, specifically in Argentina, because um, we were on, um, so in Patagonia, there's, there's a, in the south, in the Chilean side, it's um, a large part of the Chilean side is temperate rainforest. But as you um, cross over the Andes, the other side, it's a, I think it's more the kind of quintessential um, feel of pa- Patagonia. It's really been overgrazed. So we've been, we were running and running and running for thousands of miles through Patagonia, just through clouds of dust taking off into the sky as ca- sheep and cattle are literally grazing away the very life of the place. And so the amazing thing about this small area, well, actually, it's massive in Chile. How big is it, David? About 250,000 uh, hectares or something. It, uh, the, the sort of dynamics of these places have to be large because Patagonia is quite so big. But yeah, it's a really massive part. Yeah, so the amazing thing is that um, Contavesta and Patagonica, they, Chile has this area which is like the Argentinian side and it was really severely overgrazed by a, a massive estancia with cattle, sheep, horses, everything's just stripped stripped out um, the life from it. And now um, very, very slowly, they've t- well, they've taken off the, moved the livestock, and very, very slowly the land is starting to heal. And they've also worked with the, the gauchos who were there, any gauchos who were working on the property, you know, they're really concerned about the cultural side of the place as well. So they've offered any gauchos jobs in conservation as well, should they like to. So it, it's a really, it's an amazing project. And actually, lots of people get involved with internship down there as well. A lot from the US go down there. And so it was really exciting. We met, um, we met some young students who were working there and, and got sort of their point of view as well of, as working for working and um, as volunteers and for conservation in Patagonia, Patagonia down there so really exciting and one of the most exciting things for us was when we were running through Argentina we saw loads of guanacos and uh, just stunning but they were always galloping away from us and usually we saw them in the distance but the amazing thing about guanacos after a few years are now getting accustomed to people and um, we were able to sit really, really close to this animal, which is in fact, so if you think of um, llamas and llamas and um, alpacas, they're relatives of the guanaco. So actually um, the llamas are relatives. So, But it's the wild, the proper wild creature that used to roam these great huge plains down here. So tell me about where you started, the countries that you ran through and the challenges that you faced along the way. We were preparing for this challenge for, for quite a long time, but in the process of it, I made a, a slightly horrendous blunder. Um, we had a website name, first of all, to set up the challenge, and I called it the 5,000-mile project. I thought that was great. If the running cacked out and we couldn't make it, then we would carry on on foot walking. You know, it's supposed to be a running challenge, but you never know. So the name gave us that flexibility. I made a huge error. It's not 5,000 miles. It's 6,500 miles. So that's my first confession <laughs> on, to make. Um, and so what we did is we, we took the most southerly point. It was very hard to find. It's down, it's a place called Cabo Fraud, and, and it's not very well known either. But um, that was the obvious start point. And then from there, we decided a run talking about environmentalism across um, South America could simply not not involve 
Amazon. It's just so iconic. The, the issue is global. The, the entire weather systems of the, the um, northern hemisphere rely upon it as much as the south. So that was a place we would have to travel through. And once you've got those two start points, you, your route's more or less defined as you head up through Chile, the mountainous areas there, we're, we're picking the, the real rubble roads. They're called Ripio here. It's gravel. It's small. It's single track. And, and we're dragging our trailer over those things. Um, we, we select those if we can over anything else. Um, there's not a lot of joy to be had in running on a dual carriageway with lorries piling past. Sometimes we have to, but we, we don't select that if we can. So we head up through Argentina. We cross the Andes for the last time, probably level with Bariloche, which is a famous um, Argentinian town. And then we spent about five months, more or less, in Argentina running these incredibly long roads without any bends in them. It's a, it's a mental challenge more than a physical one. And then we passed into Bolivia and, and ultimately the Amazon Basin. And that was a, an extraordinary place to be because the roads that were built there were built in the 1970s. And very shortly afterwards, the, the, the sort of challenges of um, lack of usage and heavy rainfall in the tropics meant that those roads soon disappeared. So we were running with our trailer across... Um, some fairly sketchy bridges and this sort of thick rainforest mud that sticks to everything and um, stretches without anybody. You know, these are roads that cars, they cannot pass in a normal car. You can pass in a four by four in the right season. And so we passed through um, Amazona in that context. And, and there was a stretch called the Rua de Onces, which means the, the, um, the Jaguar road where everybody was quite worried that we were going to get eaten by Jaguars. And we passed through that stretch of 600 kilometers which is just an absolute blast. And then up um, over the border into Venezuela, and, and here we are in Venezuela now, we're about nine days from what we hope will be the end, and we're, we're just doing our best to stay out of the way of fast-moving cars and stay out of the way of there's some social elements here. that you, Venezuela has a certain reputation, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely don't want to be knocked on the head no. in the next couple of days. <laughs> so so that's, the, that's the route. And where we're, by the time we get to the, the place which we've, elected to be our finish point we will have covered 10,400 kilometers which is the distance between the southerly most tip and the northerly most tip of um, South America by road so that's the the ultimate challenge for us and, and hopefully we're going to get there if nothing happens in the next couple of days. So is the Venezuela reputation well deserved? Um, we're, we haven't been shot at, but we have heard gunshots, <laughs> so I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah. Um, we've been given some, you know, yeah, you have to think about it. Like, so we arrived into Venezuela, and, and of course there is this reputation which they deal with. And there are some bad elements here, like there are in most places. Um, they tend to stick to certain areas. I, I guess one thing in Venezuela is that there are towns that are run by mafia. You know, it's not just that the mafia are in certain areas of certain places there are sort of it's almost like institutional problems in some areas and we had absolutely no choice but to run through them and um the backdrop is people are telling us you will be violated one man said to me and, and sort of looked at Catherine and things like that so that's that's quite you know in some ways much more f physically wearing than any of the the marathons that we're running but you know we take those things with a pinch of salt there's a lot of good people here and and in the context of those threats they tend to come out a bit more and, and they look after us so we're doing what we can we're running early in the mornings after the sunlight has just come up and we're staying in uh, you know we, we ask people to stay in the gardens actually and they look after us and so it's a real pleasure to be here it's not hard work sometimes the towns are a bit unsettling but yeah, it, it's been great so far. I just, you know, we're, we're keeping everything crossed that it will stay that way for the next nine days. Yeah. And are you guys Spanish speakers? Hmm. <laughs> well, we like to say we're learning every day. No, I mean, the truth is we're speaking Spanish. Um, it was really important for us to do a kind of education side of things and to speak to students, to children about 
in the natural world. And so um, it was like a kind of baptism in fire. At the very beginning, we um, went to schools and said, yeah, we, we'd be happy to talk to you about our expedition, about the running and also about the natural world. And so um, we had to learn really quickly. So we've been learning all the way along and, and, and doing radio interviews and TV interviews and all kinds of things. And, and it's, it's fine. I think it's still frustrating because um, when we're really knackered, when we're really tired after running, it's hard. You know, to really talk in depth, um, it's fine being able to obviously being able to buy stuff and whatever else. But we want to really talk and be able to talk about, I don't know, about um, current affairs and talk in depth about the environment. So that's been hard, but we're getting there and it's exciting. It was a shame we had to spend three months in Brazil. That was really frustrating. But um, it's, it's, it's great again. And we're back in Venezuela speaking to people along the road. And, and that's so important. We really felt that in Brazil. And we stepped through and suddenly it was like, oh, my, you know, our, our mouths were sellotaped, um, closed or something because we just couldn't chat to people along the road. And we realized how much that avoided us in Bolivia when just lovely things like um, people would stop us and invite us into their houses or um, if we needed water, they'd bring out chairs and we'd sit and have a little chat for a bit in there, you know, amongst the chickens and pigs and everything else. And we just learned so much. And that's what we missed in Brazil. But actually, as it was, we had, you know, sort of three weeks of nobody in the middle of the Amazon. So um, it was really just speaking to McCall's anyway. So they don't speak Spanish. So that was OK. <laughs> Tell me more about the the classroom interaction that you're having with the kids and what kind of gear you need for that and how does that work well that's it's interesting we set up the the expedition you know we've got certain skills as biologists that it would we felt were worth sharing and and the kids often don't get a lot of environmental education in the places we're going in fact some places they don't get any education at all so it seemed very rude to pass through without trying to do a, a few little things and it sort of grew quite organically At the start we thought it would just be an online classroom we thought it would be us interacting with classrooms around the world via a website and using the technology we carried and, and more about that in a second but as time grew grew on and, and we passed through these villages it made absolute sense for us to stop and try and communicate with the guys who were meeting on the ground and and the feedback from that is immediate so you know when you when it's working out and you know when it's not it's really that's been quite a highlight and we've spoken to probably 1200 different kids now along the route and that's that's a blast but so to do that, I'm kind of well, we're both really keen that everybody gets the same educational experience. So, if you go into a school who's got a projector, then you play great videos and everything else. But if you go into one that hasn't, they don't get very much. And so, we decided we were going to try and pick technology that would allow us to do everything to everybody as best we could, but also go in the trailer, <laughs> which is not easy to do. What we ended up carrying was a laptop. A lot of solar power, solar chargers, because going into places which don't have charging capabilities, and backup batteries, and a mini projector, and of course cameras for for recording everything that we're doing, um, as much to get proof of where we've been as also to communicate to to people back at home how incredible these wild places are. So yeah, the, the school program has definitely meant we've had to pay a penalty in terms of um, weight in the luggage. But it's it's been just such a you know it's been probably if you were to ask what the highlights were of the of the trip and those moments although terrifying are, are up there <laughs> you know <laughs> there's a lot of running but the time in the school sticks out yeah and when we've been absolutely physically shattered and just the thought of going to a school has just been too much as soon as we get there and we meet everybody and see those faces and you know we do breakout sessions with them and talk about get their their views on what's important and why we need to look after the natural world then it's just so worth it and it's worth um it's definitely worth stopping it it's waking ourselves up and and doing it it's, it's been really amazing path actually we've really enjoyed it why why do you say it's terrifying <laughs> oh, back, back to the spanish question oh. um at the beginning uh, yeah yeah I, I, it, it's just really hard when you're not uh, you you're trying to talk to people without being condescending because a lot of the issues we're seeing in South America are actually down to to the consumption of some of the, the well the country we come from which is the United Kingdom and the US and Europe and you know a lot of the impacts are from other places you you, you don't want to go into a school of 16 year olds and say you know don't put herbivores on this land it, it can't take it when the meat that's been created is being exported. So, so anyway, it's just an example. Sometimes the messages aren't that clear cut, and you want to be very careful about what you're saying. 
and when your Spanish is a little ropey, then it's uh, it's a it, it can be difficult. But I think with um, with modern technology, you know, with videos and with slides, you can really you can really communicate with uh, and make sure that you learn most of the things you're trying to. Yeah. Although actually, we did start to um, try and incorporate schools sometimes in, as we were running. So um, in Bolivia, particularly, there were some really remote schools, and um, we actually just started. We would cut, rock up. We'd we'd done ten miles, had a quick. We wanted a quick break, so we would rock up into the school and say, "Look, we can talk to you now." And occasionally, um, for whatever reason, we didn't use the projector, and so we literally just stood up and um, unpacked the trailer, showed them what we were doing, went through the project, and it was brilliant. We loved it. So you are running unsupported. Tell me about your trailer. And are you? Did you have to cash supplies ahead of you? The the unsupported thing is it's kind of we don't have a choice on that. <laughs> we don't have a backup team, so it's uh, it's something we had to deal with from the start. But I think that's any long expedition. Uh, I know that people have used different elements of support on these things before, but for us, it. Yeah, I wouldn't really want it any other way. I think it's it's part of what we do. So, um, yeah, we kind of looked through the options for running, and um, pretty quickly it became clear we couldn't run with a backpack big enough to do the things we wanted to do. Or, or if we did, we'd probably get 100 miles, and our knees would be in turned to sawdust or something. So basically, the, the luggage had to go on something, and either we push it. Um, Dean Canas has famously pushed his trailer around after doing the 50 and 50 in the states yeah Yeah, of course a a stroller is one of the way that people go on these very very long expeditions and there's a a, the first lady to run around the world Rosie Swell Pope pulled so there's this debate at the start to push or to pull and one of the things we we tried to go to the marketplace to see if we could buy a contraption that would work there's not a huge demand for them surprisingly so <laughs> we decided um, we decided to build one and we thought if we're going to build this damn thing then we'll do it out of um, reused bicycle parts and therefore you know it'll be as light on the the environment as it can be and it'll be as functional as it can be so our trailer which is made of sort of bits of bamboo and bike frames uh, grew quite organically and it's continued to grow and it's quite fun because each piece we pick up on the roadside and, and sometimes we have to mend it with a stick from here or a piece of rubber from there. And so each piece has a little story and a little memory for us. And it's and it's entirely functional. It, it's as good a trailer as I could build with aluminium. So it's really, it's um, it's a great thing. It's made of bamboos and bike tires. Yeah. And I must admit, sometimes I've, I've wished that there has been a support vehicle there to massage my thighs or whatever at the end of the day or to, bro- to provide us with a you know, meal or something. But, um, wow, no, it wouldn't be right. Um, we just It's amazing to be there out on our own. In huge stretches of Argentina, it was just us and the stars at night and trying to find a camp. It's really it's been such an adventure, that part of things. If we'd had people there... It would have changed everything. And also, I mean, because we're doing it for the natural world, we didn't want to have a car. That would be against what we want to do. The whole point is it, no, it's it human solar powered. powered. That, yeah, we did, go through, we, did, we did think about Next my mum. Next time mom. we do this, we're definitely having a solar-powered <laughs> car with Catherine's mum in it with ice cream and a solar-powered fridge. <laughs> yeah, but as it, as it is, we've got this thing behind us. And gosh, there's been times when I have screamed and kicked at the thing, It's especially through thick mud. On steep hills and going down the hills, it's really painful on the knees um, when you've got a heavy weight behind you. And at stages, it's been over. Well, we've measured it's been uh, weighed it. It's been over 100 kgs. Yeah, sometimes it's the devil. (laughs) How many miles are you running a day? A running goal of a day is 20 miles a day, and that seemed to be about as much as we could manage. Bearing in mind we're, we're pulling this pretty heavy thing behind us and and that's totally fair so so Catherine pulls the uh, you know one runs with it for um five miles eight kilometers and then we swap you know after a few hours the day is done and we're beat sat on the floor so that that was in the past so for most of the the journey it's been about 20 miles a day for the last two months we've ramped it up a little bit and we've done quite a few days with marathons back to back and and for the last nine days, we're going to try and do seven marathons in seven days, pulling this trailer as well. So we've got, we're always trying to find ways of making it hurt a little bit more. But actually, what we're trying to do is get finished quicker. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about the decision to run in the barefoot style. 
Yes, well, um, it's funny because we were looking for somebody to help us run, really, um, like a coach. And um, a friend of mine um, suggested that he had a mate who's a barefoot um, coach. And um, when I first heard that, um, we both thought, oh, gosh, you know, heard a bit about this, but not not sure at all. So um, so we sort of left that. And then um, we got hold of a copy of Born to Run by um, Chris McDougal. McDougal, that's right. And incredible. Uh, it really just made sense. Absolutely amazing, inspiring book. And um, so based on how humans had begun running in the savannas of, of Africa, of course, barefoot, they weren't shoes, and how they run, ran extraordinary distances after hunting down gazelles. And then, in fact, humans have really, you know, the way that we're formed, the way um, our body works, running is really works for us. And it all started to make sense. And we were aware that we're going to be doing something incredibly, you know, for, for day after day, month after month, huge distances. We really need to look after our body. The main thing we we're, you know, really, really scared about an injury. I mean, that would just stop everything. And so it's all started to make sense. And um, so I got in contact with this guy. And he's called John O'Gibbon. Because he wasn't with us, it was a shame. But we started to develop this kind of relationship. So Skype, he would we'd talk to him, we'd chat through any problems we were having. We would send him videos and he would an analyze them um, by slowing down the footage and seeing how we were running. And the first thing he came up with, he just said, ah, oh, you know, classic, um, your, your heel striking, w um, which is what happens when you have big cushioned shoes, um, which means you get a lot of shock down the back of your, um, down your back. Um, he said, your, your, your strides are too long. And so we, we were working on things like that. And basically, we had to run much quicker, much quicker rhythm. So 180 beats per minute. minute. I was going to say second. That would be extraordinary. <laughs> 180 beats per minute. And, um, and, and also very upright, short, quick steps. So we started to learn. We had three months to do it in Uruguay. And I never realized that you would have to learn to run. I just assumed it would just be innate. But in fact, because... Um, most people run in, in big heels, then you are the way that we've been running most of our lives, Dave and I and most people, is a very differently to how we would have run if we had always been barefoot. So we started to get used to that in Uruguay, running on the beach, well, actually running on gravel roads a lot of the time, sometimes on beach paths, um, on tarmac, whatever. And we would do um, shifts of sort of very, very gradually ramping it up. So we would take we would take a pair of trainers, take them off, keep keep switching, and then eventually we got some barefoot shoes. And the idea of those it sounds a bit crazy. If, you, if you're running barefoot, why do you need shoes? The idea is that if it's a really really sharp surface, it's going to hurt, and our feet are just not we haven't got thick enough skin. Um, and also, if you're in an urban setting and there's glass and things like that, the idea is they're really light, and um, so they just but they haven't got a heel. And they allow you to run in that barefoot style, which is very difficult if you've got a, a thick heel on. So we started to do it, and it started to make sense. Um, no, I don't. I don't think we would be here, at, you know, nearing the end of the expedition had we not done that. I think it's been so fundamental to run in that style with small steps and and removing some of the impacts or minimising them. And actually, I'm to the point now where, I, you know, if I have a choice of which shoes I can put on, I'd definitely try and put some barefoot ones on it you get the feedback from what's going on around you on the ground yeah it's a real it's a real pleasure for me to put them on <laughs> and also when you're barefoot it's lovely if you've got a good surface you can either be glooping around in mud as you run or you can be having a bit of a scratch mm. in the gravel it's brilliant i mm. love it too but the only thing we did learn specifically for us when we began we were mainly wearing our barefoot shoes and we soon realized with the trailer it hurt because it's a big difference come pulling that bloody great brute of a thing <laughs> it really changes the way that your body is, is the angle of your body you're more forward um trying to pull this thing along and it just didn't work with the barefoot shoes it was causing mm -hmm. too much of a stress on our achilles tendons so what we now and well what we did and what we've continued through the entire expedition is when we're running with the trailer we run with a slight heel of six millimeters which is less than the conventional running shoe so it's like a transition shoe and for the rest of the time we're either in our barefoot shoes or running barefoot if we can how'd you two meet <laughs> uh, we we met at um, a university which was in sheffield in england and it's about halfway between where i live near Scotland and where Catherine lives at the other end of the country. Near France, just about, uh, <laughs> it's about yeah. far away. But the funny, we, thing uh, was, yeah, the, yeah, the funny thing was it was running, actually. So um, we sort of met um, th in, in our 
um, halls of residence and we were chatting with another couple of guides and, and we both agreed we'd go running, the, well, the, all four of us, and off we headed into the Valley Park. So running's been a bit of a theme actually for mm. us. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned from this expedition? Gosh, actually, um, I think we're both um, conservation biologists. And as we said at the beginning, the reason, the main driver of this expedition was the natural world and just a huge passion and inspiration for wild places and wildlife. And actually, when we've been down, it's been the wildlife that has brought us through. It's amazing when we've been arguing or whatever because we're hungry or tired or just whatever. It's been seeing, you know, a parrot up close or something that we thought was a bit of lichen or a moss and then suddenly it ups and trots off and is actually a little bug. You know, things like that have been absolutely absolutely extraordinary but the thing about it is that the environment is hard for people i think a lot of people see it as something restrictive rather than something amazing they see that it's something that maybe confines the way they want to live but it doesn't have to i mean for us it's just trying to live a bit more in harmony with nature with them with our amazing planet it, it can be really really just so inspiring so um i think for us because of our goals for conservation, actually, if we had chosen um, a human charity, perhaps whatever, cancer or, you know, I hate to say it, but if, uh, if um, a fa family member died and we were running for them, you know what, I think we would have got more interest. So actually, you know, conservation environment can be tricky. But as I say, it's, it's such an extraordinary thing. And I always say to children, you know, you can just never get bored because there's so much to learn. There's so many fascinating things. We've just been constantly amazed by what's surrounded us. But also it's been tough because a lot of what we are seeing has been degraded by humans, by what, we, by what, what we're all doing. But um, there's always hope and we can, we can definitely, we can, we can do it if we want to with lots of little actions everybody can do every day to make a huge difference to this incredible world that we've got you're about nine days or so away from finishing after that what's next <laughs> <laughs> we've um we've got to sort of slowly rejoin what people call the real world which will involve no running of course and then so yeah on the 20th of october we, we're going to finish in, the, in this place we're going to see the sea for the first time since we left the very far south of um chile so it'll be a very different sea so I think first things first, we're going to get in there and splash about a bit and not run for a day or two. Then we're going to go to Caracas. Um, we've got a few interviews planned and then off to London on the 26th where we'll be doing a run to celebrate running, which <laughs> should be a blast. And we've got a, a talk planned, doing some film stuff there and maybe some interviews, meet with our um, parliamentary representatives. So um, go and see government contacts. And we've got a small amount of time off, and then we go back to Uruguay. We've got a, a, a slight job to do. Our, our house is a boat, and we have to sail that boat back to the UK. She's been resting patiently for us in Uruguay, so that's the next big project that we've got to we've got to undertake. <laughs> and actually, on the um, 26th of October, if anybody who's listening is anywhere near London, you're all invited. We're going to be um, in centre of London running. And um, then, yeah, it'll be, as Dave was saying, it'll be followed by um, a talk presentation about the adventure with films. And um, for more details, details about that, um, as well as, as Paul said, you can go to our website, which is 5000mileproject.org. Or also we've got Facebook, YouTube and Twitter, all um, giving loads of details about what we're up to. And that's 5000 Mile Project for all of those. Catherine and David Lowry, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on your expedition, the huge, David, what was it, 6,500 miles? Um, yeah, it will be if we can, if we can make it, yeah. <laughs> well, I have faith in you guys. You guys are going to make it. Thanks so, so much, Paul. It's been a real you. pleasure talking no, to you. No, it's been a blast. Thanks so much, Paul. Yeah. You're welcome. Recorded October 8, 2013. For more great podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com. 